any time. Um, would enjoy to talk more about that. So, and as always, thanks a lot for the gift. Uh, I know probably on behalf of all of our pastors, it's a, it's a joy to serve here and uh, love our church family. So thanks, thanks a lot for that. And I'm excited for the Christmas season. Uh, today we're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 40, so to kind of turn our attention to God's Word this morning. Uh, if you're following along, Isaiah chapter 40. All right, so uh, Isaiah 40 is actually uh, part of the assigned reading. If you're following along with our readings, this is one of the assigned readings from the previous week, uh, but chose to use this because it folds into our Advent season a little bit, looking to the person of Jesus. Um, also, just an important text here in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah may be one of the more um, deep theological books of the Old Testament, 66 books long, and kind of broken into two big parts, uh, 1 through 39 and then 40 through 66. So uh, chapter 40 here is kicking off the second piece of Isaiah that, that really is a, a pretty prophetic look at a lot of how uh, just God's larger narrative that's unfolding, right? So uh, we'll look at that a little bit. Um, and as we come to the end of this year, many of you doing the readings uh, through the Bible in a year, uh, just been really encouraged by people who have been engaged with God's Word. Uh, a lot of people too just saying there's been a little increase in their understanding or knowledge of just the biblical narrative, so the overarching story that unfolds in the Bible that really uh, had truthfulness historically, but also we see it playing out spiritually in our lives today. So been encouraged with that. Uh, just wanted to touch on a few of those highlights. We've been trying to, as we have a message, kind of connect it to some of the overarching themes. And uh, you remember back in January, we started in creation, right? At Genesis, uh, God created male and female in the image of God. He created created them, talked about that. They were in the garden and then sin entered into the world. So they were pushed out of the garden. Um, and, and we see there the really things kind of continued to decline. The flood happens. God raises up this man, uh, Abram, who we know to be Abraham. And he gives Abraham this promise that he's going to make him into a nation of many people. So Israel is the nation he's talking about there. Israel really brought up out of nothing. So God, uh, that, that idea of God creating out of nothing is, is unique to him as God and also something we see throughout Scripture, uh, kind of a, a theme of Scripture here, that God created people out of nothing and then he creates a nation out of nothing. So Israel begins to form and we see them gathering in Egypt. So we find uh, all the Israelites in Egypt and God decides that it's time to deliver his people, to call his people out of Egypt to have some uniqueness, to be set apart. Uh, so it's, a, it's around the year 1300 BC uh, that, that the Israelites are called out of Egypt. They have fun, four, 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. They find their way into Canaan, this promised land, and the 12 tribes settle into Canaan, all spread out. Uh, they have their different locations, um, and, and they, they decide that they want a king which was really a worldly desire. They were a theophany at first, or theocracy at first, where God was leading the people. Uh, then we went, they, so they had priests and prophets, right? Priests and prophets standing between God and the people. And then they had judges ruling over the people on God's behalf. And then they get into kings. They wanted kings. You remember King Saul to King David to King Solomon. After him, one of his sons, we have Jeroboam and Rehoboam. And it's then around... 975 BC, that Israel breaks into two. Okay, so the nation of Israel is now divided into two segments, northern Israel, southern Judah, which is where Jerusalem would have been. And shortly after this, the uh, God's hand of judgment through Assyria and Babylon starts to take place. So the Assyrians come into northern Israel, and they're led into exile. They're knocking on the door of southern Israel, Israel, which is Judah, and where Jerusalem is, there's some threat happening there. And it seems it's in this time when Isaiah, the prophet, is writing, and, and we know that Babylon is going to come in and take over Judah. 
right? It's going to overthrow Jerusalem, and they'll be led into uh, exile. In chapter 39 of Isaiah, you can actually see the first mention that it's going to be Babylon who exiles Judah. Uh, there, there's a lot of foreshadowing, a lot of foresight uh, that this exile is coming, that this judgment is coming. Isaiah chapter 39 to King Hezekiah, which is interesting because, because King Hezekiah was actually one of the more godly kings, but he made some bad choices and God revealed it through Isaiah uh, that it, it was going to be Babylon to come and overthrow Judah. So we're, we're looking at kind of at that time frame here and... Uh, Isaiah, speaking about Babylon, uh, leaving this message with the people. Uh, important to understand a little bit how Babylon is used throughout Scripture as well. So Babylon, uh, again, an, another term that's used throughout Scripture, and, and we'll touch on this briefly, even into the book of Revelation, we see talk of Babylon. So Babylon kind of has this dual purpose. One, historically, Babylon is a real place with real people, and there were real conflicts. You could go do research on them historically, and they really had a dislike for the nation of Israel, and, and we can see uh, research that suggests their conflict with each other. Those things actually happened, uh, but also spiritually speaking, Babylon resembles this idea and this presence of evil, okay? So, so Babylon is a representation, spiritually speaking, of the presence of evil and opposition to the people of God. So as we read the book of Isaiah, we're reading it through this lens of understanding, okay, some of this is history, and it really happened, but some of this still is here for us today, and Babylon is still active today. So every single person who walked in here this morning, we could start in the very first row and zigzag all the way back, and we could have every single person stand up and every single person in here could share today how Babylon has hold of you in some way. Babylon is still tormenting people. It's still bringing hardship, still bringing attack, right? Babylon is still knocking at the doors. Some of you, to, to greater extents than others, Babylon really has hold the enemy. And it's heavy. And it's hard. And you're wondering, how am I getting through this? What is the purpose of this? Where is God in the midst of this? And Isaiah here is giving a message from God for the people who are about to be invaded by Babylon. So there's a message here for all of us today uh, as well, spiritually speaking, that we would receive uh, from God. So we get that in, in chapter 40, uh, this message from Isaiah. That's what we're going to look at. Uh, I'm going to pray for us, just commit this time to the Lord, and then uh, we'll read here chapter 40, verses 1 through 8. Let me take this. Let me get rid of my keys. I'll fidget with them. Well, Lord Jesus, we come before you this morning, and uh, we just pause for a moment. We've had a lot uh, going on, and we're so thankful for children, Lord, and the holiday season, the busyness of it, uh, or a chance to interact with friends and family and coworkers. And uh, Father God, we just pray this morning that you would fix our eyes on this amazing reality that Jesus has come uh, to save us, not to condemn us, uh, but to call us out of the weightiness of spiritual darkness. So God, we pray this morning that you would use uh, the words that are spoken and what's written here in, in your word uh, just to transform our hearts and our minds. God, that you would send us out of here encouraged and strengthened uh, with a gift of hope that only you can give to us. So we give this time to you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, so here we go. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 8. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry, and I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. 
The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. All right, so again, this is, uh, we're not going to get into the details of parsing out the, the difference of kind of perspectives here on, on when exactly Isaiah is given this. But it seems here, Isaiah, who wouldn't have been around when, when the people were bought, brought back from Babylonian exile, we read about that in Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, he, he had penned this for God's people as they're getting ready for everything that's happening, right? And, and the first thing I want us to notice here is right away in verse 1 and verse 2, the tone of the text. So this is in time of judgment. Right, so we have that balance here. God's judgment on the people, his, his anger with the people for their disobedience. But he comes back around with this tone that's comforting, is gentle, is compassionate. He's saying, comfort, comfort my people. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. You, you parse out the, the Hebrew there, that speak tenderly. And it could literally be broken apart as speak to the heart. Speak to the heart of my people. And, and it, you, you read commentaries on this, and, and they say, what an image of the heart of God that this is laying out here. The, the God of compassion, the God of mercy, the God of grace, really coming down and speaking to the heart of the people that they would be comforted in the midst of this message of judgment. Like Babylon is coming. Babylon is on the way. Judgment is coming. But there is this message of peace. There's this message of comfort, tenderness. We also see here, uh, comfort, comfort, my people speak tenderly to Jerusalem. So there's this reality here of, uh, and and this is growing concern within the church at large uh, in our society today, something to be watchful for. But this, this word right here is for the people of God. Comfort, comfort, my people. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. So there's this growing idea of universalism, really, that all people are God's children. And that all people will have this place in God's kingdom, that he has a plan to redeem all people. But we see throughout Scripture, that's not the case. That's, that's something, that's a formulation that's been projected into the Scriptures by people. The, the theory throughout Scripture and what is clearly communicated is there are God's people and there are people who are not God's people. Jesus calls them sheep and goats, right? Israel and Babylon. Right, there's two parties involved here, and there's a message for God's people. And this is a message, if you're here in Christ today, it's a message for you of tenderness, of compassion, of comfort in the midst of the battle with Babylon, whatever's going on in your life. There's this message of hope that God is, is delivering. Speak tenderly to the people. We see his shepherding heart here. Uh, verse 2 there, the second part of it, cry to her. For God's children. And what's the message? Warfare has ended. Her warfare is ended. That that would have been a word he's used uh, most often for kind of military service. So it would have been about soldiers getting ready to go into battle and and oftentimes talked about a specific segment of time. So it's saying your, your time of service for military action is done. Warfare is over. Right? It might say hardship. Your translation might say hardship. The hardship has ceased. You get to go home, relieved of your duties. Right? The, we go on a little bit more there. Your iniquity is pardoned. So all the hardship that was coming was result of poor decisions that have been made or judgment from God is consequence for wrongdoing. Parents, we, we understand this, right? We, we, our kids have consequences for their wrongdoing. But usually, if, if, they, if they really make a mistake, you want to come back around to them and let them know, but we love you, and we're here for you, and, and we want to comfort you in that, right? And God's getting to that place of saying, uh, the, the punishment for iniquity has ceased. It's over. And then there's this comment on uh, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Again, different perspectives there. Uh, double for all her sins uh, may just mean an abundance, Okay, uh, so we see here uh, some, the firstborn son oftentimes might receive a double portion. 
Now, that, that doesn't mean exactly a, a double amount. It means in, in excess or in abundance. So they have received uh, a lot of God's judgment. The other uh, possibility here is kind of this two-headed monster of Assyria and Babylon, a, a double portion. Assyria came and wreaked havoc, but now Babylon has come, and you've received double for this sin. Another possibility here, and I think really all three are, are reasonably at play, is the reality that Jesus, who they don't understand yet completely, but Jesus has paid for the iniquities of all people. What he did on the cross works retroactively for all people. So any wrong that Israel did, even before Jesus is born, is paid for on the cross. And that was one sense of source of judgment. But now they also are experiencing this in the physical life themselves, double portion. So whatever it is here, uh, they've received enough, right? Warfare has ended. The, uh, the iniquity is pardoned. Now, what's God doing here? Why does Isaiah deliver this message? It's an amazing gift of grace. It's, it's an amazing gift for them to keep tucked in their back pocket that's a source of hope. Because they're getting ready to go into this exile, this turmoil with Babylon. But they already know that God has laid out this plan. It's like God already sees the future that there will be this day when somebody shows up and says, war is over. Turmoil's over. You're, you're relieved from that. You know, I, I think of winter. Right? Does anybody here not like winter? We got some people who don't like winter. That's okay. We got some people who really don't like winter. <laughs> All right, hands are straight up. Yep, winter's tough. It's gray. Has anybody seen the sun? Like in a week? All right, it's just like I talked to somebody at the Live Nativity, moved from Colorado. He misses the sun. I said, Welcome to Ohio. You know, the days are short. It's dark when you get up, it's dark when you go to sleep. Maybe that's good because you just sleep it away. It's depressing for some people, really, literally depressing. It's like everything's died, there's no color, but something's coming, and it's the reason you don't move south, probably. You know there's a promise, because you've experienced it before, there's something coming, and it gives you hope, and it gets you through the hard days, and we know your mind is set on it because you're already talking about it, right? What are we looking forward to? Spring, spring. You talk about it when you get up, and you talk about it when you lie down, and you talk about it when you walk along the streets. You hang pictures of it in your house. You start to grow seeds that turn into small plants, and there's signs of spring that you're planting along the way, right? You're you're doing that because it's getting you through winter, and you know that there is a day coming, and it will come when the light is going to again shine into the darkness, and life will come up where everything looks like it's dead. It's spring, and it keeps you here in Ohio. Otherwise, we'd all move south, where it was colorful, right? Some of you love winter. I'm fine with winter. Uh, I like winter, getting out and uh, doing things in the snow. But the point here is God has given them this promise. He's given them something that says spring's coming. So it's going to be tough. This is going to be a mess but spring's coming. So when you get weary and and when you start hearing the message of Babylon that's saying like, hey, your, your, your hero's not showing up. You might as well settle in. You might as well accept our language. You might as well put your roots down. You know to say, no, I'm holding out for spring. I'm gonna continue to water my plants and I'm going to continue to plan my, my spring vacation, or uh, I'm, I'm going to continue to repair my mower because spring is coming. So we start living as if this future is coming. God has graciously gifted his people with this promise that the war is over, right? Spring's coming. Now, if we're here today, Babylon has hold of us. There's a simple reminder there. Spring is coming. But what do we do with it in the meantime when winter's here? Right? You're thinking, it's heavy. I don't like it. Babylon's right at my doorstep. Or Babylon's got me tangled up. And that looks different for everybody. It might play out in your life physically. 
You might have some brokenness. You might have some chronic illness, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, professionally, family dynamics. Babylon pressing in. What do we do with it in the midst of it? We see it laid out here. Verse 3, a voice cries, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, the high places a plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Prepare. Prepare in the wilderness. Babylon's here, but spring's coming. There's a promise. So what do we do now? In the wilderness, we prepare. We prepare for what is to come. We know the wilderness is a theme throughout Scripture, right? For a reason. The wilderness is real. In this life, like people, people go through wilderness seasons. It's hardship. What do we do in the wilderness? We prepare. We keep our eyes looking up to the future of all that is to come. And what are we preparing for? It's not spring. Preparing for the Lord. Right? So the, the imagery here, uh, verses 3 through 5, the imagery here would have been used for uh, these monarchs in the east, the kings, the rulers in the east, when they were going to travel a distance, they would send out a team ahead of them uh, uh, who would go out and they would prepare the way for the kings. So if, if they're going through the mountains, they're going through the woods, they're going through these remote villages, they send out a team before them, maybe like secret service for the president, right? He, the, the team goes ahead and they prepare the way. They make sure that it's smooth. Figuratively, they're, they're making the mountains go low and the valleys go high. They're clearing it out so it's like a smooth plain. So that when the king comes on his horses or his camels or in his chariot, when the king comes, it's smooth sailing. Right? He's the one who gets the royal treatment. But they got to deploy the team ahead. So as the team is deployed ahead, you can imagine living in some of those remote villages or remote places. You, you, you live there and you see this team of people coming and they start preparing a way. And it triggers in your mind, oh, there's somebody of prominence who's coming after them. And there starts to be some chatter in town that says, hey, they're here clearing the way making sure that everything's safe for their king so that he can just arrive. And when he arrives, people aren't surprised. People aren't surprised when the monarch arrives because the way has already been prepared. And the team who's deployed out ahead, the ambassadors of this nation who are sent out by the king, they are the ones who are communicating already, hey, king's coming. So we got to make it smooth we got to prepare the way, and when he comes, just don't be alarmed, right? It's preparing the way for what is to come here, and his glory will be revealed. His glory will be revealed, and everyone will see it. If Babylon has hold of you, be comforted. The war is going to end, and there's a task to do. There's a task for us in the midst of it, that gives purpose and meaning. We're preparing, right? A couple weeks ago, uh, our staff team went down to Columbus to this church. I remember uh, we had this For the Kingdom initiative, time of 20 days of prayer and fasting, and a piece of that was uh, to give financially from a place of sacrifice. Uh, so we had about $17,000 came in. We sent about 12000 of that to the team in Kur uh, Kurdistan. We sent about $5,000 of that to this church in Columbus, so our staff team, we went down there and visited this church in Columbus. And some of you know the, the, the background of this. Uh, they're in the place in Columbus where uh, prostitution rates are the highest, murder rates are the highest, life expectancy is the lowest. Their schools are in the lowest 5% of the state of Ohio. One of their schools is the lowest 1% in the state of Ohio. Uh, while we were there, the, the pastor shared that just the past week, uh, they had a little boy show up at church who comes oftentimes. He showed up and he, he, was, he was bleeding down his face because his sister hit him in the head with a board. And, and they bring him back and they try and call children's services, but they really don't have time for that because children's services is overflowing. 
right? So, so you know, drugs are heavy. It, it's, it's a mess. And, and you step back and part of you thinks, why do you live there? Right? The pastor had to take his kids out of the schools because they were such a mess. It, it wasn't even a learning environment. Bottom 1%, that, that's like the worst school in the state of Ohio. Why do you live there? I want you to move out. Right? You might think, well, people aren't choosing to live there. They live there because of poverty. No, there are actually people like this pastor who are choosing to live there where houses are $40,000, not $400,000. Why do you choose to live there? Because there's people there in that area where Babylon is heavy and winter is dark and they don't know spring's coming. They don't know spring's coming. And they're just hunkered down trying to survive the winter. And they're wondering if anything might happen to flip and they might catch a break. So there's people like Pastor Ben who go there to let them know spring's coming. Spring's coming. And they deserve to hear it. And there's people there who do know spring's coming. But you can imagine that it's still exhausting. It's exhausting to live there. Right? He, said, he said they don't use calendars there. They, just, they don't use calendars there because you don't know what's going to happen the next day. You're literally just trying to get through the next day, right? You just want food to eat. You want kids to be safe, right? They, they rarely have people watch their kids for obvious reasons, right? They're, they're just trying to survive. There's people there like that who need to be reminded spring's coming. And they need people like us to speak into their ear, spring's coming. And we love you. And we care for you. And we're here to encourage you, right? So people step into that environment. And, and isn't that the gospel? You come down from your high places. We read about Amos, right? You cows of Bashan, you're getting fat. You're, you're grazing where it's green. Come out of your cozy beds with all the jewelry and the luxuries. You come down. Jesus came down. We read Philippians chapter 2. He humbled himself and became a servant. Right? He humbled himself even to the point of death, even death on a cross, where he gave his life for the people. He stepped down into the mess. He actually came into Babylon when he had the royal palace to enjoy. But he denied it. He denied himself. He came down, and he lives that out. And that is our model of what we see here. That's the gospel message. We see, whoops, I want to use that, right? We see here Matthew chapter 3, Matthew 3, we'll get into uh, the New Testament a little bit. The arrival of Jesus. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, for this is he who is spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said hundreds of years ago, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. You see, so the arrival of Jesus was fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 40. Right? It's talking, there, there will be this day when it ends, and then Jesus shows up and they say, hey, this is the one who Isaiah was talking about. You know, in the book of Isaiah, there's, there's over 400 nods to the book of Isaiah in the New Testament. Just, just the book of Isaiah overlaps. There's so much prophetic language and if you haven't read the book of Isaiah, you should read through it because the, the New Testament is so intertwined with it. Over 400 times it references the prophet of Isaiah. And here it is. Jesus shows up and he says, hey, this is the one who they said, prepare the way of the Lord. The, the king is actually arriving. The team that was deployed out ahead, the king has arrived. Now, what's, what's Isaiah writing about here? There's prophecy that was fulfilled historically, right? Because Israel went into exile with Babylon and they were actually brought out of that. They got to come back. You can read about that in Ezra and Nehemiah. They, they came back. But then there's a second segment where it's looking ahead to the coming of Jesus and Jesus fulfills that prophecy. But then there's a third segment that has to do with eschatology and times when everything will be completely restored. So we've been gifted with part of this fulfillment. We know the truth of Jesus, 
but there's yet to be this coming completion of his restoration when all things are made new, right? And interesting here, Isaiah chapter 40 through 66, I mentioned there, 40 through 66, it's a, it's a prophetic look of, of what's going to unfold. And at the beginning of the gospel, Matthew chapter 3, chapter 40 of Isaiah is referenced, prepare the way of the Lord. You get to chapter 66 of Isaiah, the end of it, and it's referenced in Revelation chapter 21, the very end. A new heaven and a new earth is bookends for the New Testament, right? All totally intertwined. And actually, you can read there in Revelation 18, you can read and it says, Behold, Babylon has fallen. So Babylon, theme of Babylon continues even into Revelation. And when Jesus returns to redeem his people, to establish the new heavens and the new earth, in God's eyes, that's when Babylon has fallen. Okay, so we get to see just how he's working in the midst of this is that, that terminology we've been using of already, not yet, right? We're already experiencing some of it, but it hasn't yet fully come. And that's our, our Christmas joy, right? Is that we are the people who get to live in this world, in this life, with this promise of something that is to come. And for his people, like he's, he's given you this. He's given you this word, this promise that says Babylon's here. The, the attack isn't enjoyable. It's going to be hard, but there's a day coming. And he loves you so much that he gave you this ahead of time to help you get through to know spring's coming. Spring's coming. You know, I think you receive the words in this, Pastor Tim and I talked about this this morning, like, if, the, if there's not really understanding of this, like, empty religion does nothing over a, a relationship with the living God. And until the words of the letter from God come to life in a person's heart, it's, somewhat, it's just rote religion. But the breath of God's Spirit, the fullness of His life, the experience of His joy, of His peace, the taste of that, the foretaste of that is gifted to His people when they receive it and really let it transform them and brings uh, new life. And then we get to be those signs of spring. Right? That's what we are now. We prepare the way. Uh, I'll close with this last part of Psalm 40. Get back to it here. Or Isaiah 40, sorry. So we see here the, the last portion. You, know, you might struggle with that tension of uh, just pressing on. Like we, we've already received the gift of Jesus. We have that hope. We have that assurance. It gives us life, but it's still difficult. There's a good balance here of the, just how temporary our lives are. Uh, starting in verse 6, Isaiah 40, verse 6. A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. I think a, a great reminder, a great message that we don't get lost or sidetracked and building up uh, for things of Babylon, when in reality, gr life is like grass. It's so fleeting. Like we're going to be at the end of our life, and it's going to be so fast. So don't, don't listen to the enemy. Stick with the Lord. His word will stand forever. We have that promise, uh, and it's shown to us through the person of Jesus. So uh, as you go this morning, uh, I'm praying that, that you would go out of here with joy, knowing that whatever hardship you come in here with, as days are numbered, as days are numbered, and God is inviting you into being the, deployed as a part of that team that's paving the way that says spring is coming. And take joy in knowing that spring is 
coming. As surely as spring has come every year of our lives, Jesus is coming, and he will destroy the enemy, renew things uh, for all time. So keep pressing on. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, uh, we just thank you for the gift of your word. Uh, Lord, uh, this amazing reality that, that it is ours and that you have chosen us to be a people for such a time as this in this world, and you are equipping us to navigate it. Lord, what an amazing act of grace it is that you have laid out before us uh, your words that we can know to be true, and what an amazing thing of the, the uniqueness of the Christian faith, that it's not some, uh, it's not some philosophy that people have come up with, it's, uh, it's history revealing the truthfulness of who you are. Uh, this book being written centuries uh, over a span of centuries by a multitude of people who lived in a multitude of different places and how interwoven it is with such a lack of any sort of conflict. Uh, Lord, it's amazing. It's amazing. And we praise you for it, God, that uh, it has found us. And Lord, I pray that you would burden our hearts for people living in this world who do not know spring's coming. God, that we would find the people around us uh, who need that encouragement, who need that source of hope. And Lord, give us the words uh, to be life givers to them, to point them towards you. And Lord, that they would know the freedom that comes from knowing that their pardon or that their iniquities have been pardoned. Lord Jesus, that you have paid the price, that our sins are pardoned. We praise you for it, God. Uh, pray that you would be our joy this week. Pray that you would be our hope this week. Uh, we love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay, well, after the service, uh, if you'd like to pray with anybody, you're invited uh, to come forward for prayer, spend some time with us. Uh, otherwise, you may go. Have a great week. Merry Christmas. If we